The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back. Senators, Nats, Twins, Baseball, Past, Present, and Future. I'm Ralph Tycho, and the host of the show is George Case III. How are you, sir? I'm just fine. Thank you, Ralph. Good. You have a very, very interesting show planned, and I hope you'll um, tell us about it, sir. Okay. Well, what I'd like to do before, uh, you know, we talk a little bit about the subject is uh, introduce David Hubler, who uh, David and I have uh, collaborated a few times, and especially I provided some information to him for his uh, wonderful book, uh, The Nats and the Grays. Uh, also on the podcast is uh, Gene Hutmaker, uh, who has written a book, uh, Band in the Bronx. Uh, Gene is a, a longtime Yankee hater. And uh, also on the podcast is Chad Rubin. Uh, Chad is a Minnesota Twins, a uh, great uh, n- font of knowledge of uh, Twins baseball, and we're happy to have Chad uh, with us as well. I, I just thought beginning the new year, uh, on such a cold, cold day. By the way, here in the east, it's just bitter. Uh, I think where Ralph is in California, it's certainly uh, more like baseball weather. But, um, you know, spring spring training isn't too far away, and uh, we're going to be happy to see the, the bare ground. But right now, it is just brutally cold here in the east. So what I'd like to do is maybe have a uh, discussion with all of us. Uh, David and I would talk a little bit about... Uh, the transition of Washington baseball to uh, to Minnesota and the type of team that Washington had uh, during my dad's career and what the team had become later and uh, as it then went to Minnesota and the expansion team came in, again, a uh, transition had to be made. So we can talk about those things. And, David, I'd like to, uh, you know, just turn it over to you if you want to make a few comments about you know, Washington baseball before we really get started on the subject. Yeah, okay. Thanks, thanks, George. Uh, one of the things that most, uh, I think, fans of the game um, uh, have have overlooked uh, is when we talk about what's on baseball and the Senators being such a poor team is that they really weren't such a poor team. Um, during, during the war, for example, they only finished last once and they finished second twice. Um, and if you look at uh, look at it in terms of finances. Um, they did rather well. They were usually uh, second or third in uh, total attendance in the American League during those years. So uh, it wasn't that they were that bad. When that and also uh, the first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League really was written back in about 1890, 1900 uh, to refer to the previous group that uh, was known as the Senators, and then it was resurrected um, when they began to fall apart again or or lose, let's say, uh, back toward the the start of the the 50s or so. Um, So those are a couple of things that people sort of overlook, and and of course, now that the Nationals are are here in town, and... um, you know, if they if they had kept the name the senators, I think they would there would have been more interest nationally uh, in the franchise itself. Um, this being a franchise that came down from Montreal, uh, had not I don't believe has uh, aside from the fact that they have a really good team now, uh, hasn't managed to de- put a dent in that old uh, vision of the Senate as being this hapless squad of ball players. You know what, David, I, I think uh, you're absolutely right, and I wanted to you know, step in here and talk a couple minutes about that because there is confusion uh, with the name. And uh, it, Ralph Tycho, who's uh, our gracious uh, host, and, and uh, we do these podcasts uh, really because of, of Ralph, uh, the Washington Nationals slash Senators is how I always refer to the ball club. When when my dad played, and for the many years before that, with Walter Johnson and the and the great 1924 team that that won the uh, World Series, 
uh, the name was interchanged. It was it was senators uh, at at times. It was Nats at times. Both names were used, but the team played in the American League. And today you have the same nickname, the Nats, the Washington Nationals, but the team plays in the National League. So it is a totally different franchise. As David mentioned, it it really has its uh, origins in Montreal, uh, and the Washington Ball Club had its or- origins uh, in uh, Washington, the original Nats Senators that then became the Minnesota Twins. So, And the expansion Senators then became the Texas Rangers. So there are sometimes people get confused by the name, uh, it is Washington. Uh, the, the correlation of the teams really doesn't exist because they were all different franchises. And the fact is that you have the Minnesota Twins, a great team. With, with We can talk about some of those great players. And, Chad, you're welcome to step in here. And, and Gene, you certainly know a lot of those great players as well. Um, but the fact is that you have Washington baseball, still existing today, which is great, but the franchise is really totally different and the league is totally different from the earlier days. Okay. May I interject one thing? I think, I'm one of the few that think it was a good idea to name the current team the Nats, only because it would avoid the confusion of having three senator teams. Uh, I thought that the expansion um, team should have been, first of all, the expansion team should have been in Minnesota, with all due respect, um, and it would have it would have made things a, an awful lot easier. Um, I'm still unclear as how Griffith pulled that off, I think it was a remarkable um, thing from his, from a personal standpoint, from his personal standpoint, it was remarkable, but I think it uh, led to a lot of confusion, and I think naming the team the Nats um, avoids few, uh, further confusion. That's just You know, Ralph, Ralph, I agree with you when it comes to that. I think the only... The only thing that bothers me, and it doesn't, I shouldn't say bothers me, but the, when the confusion is that, you know, people talk about the great, you know, Washington Nationals franchise, which it is today. It is a wonderful franchise. They've done very well. I think at some point you're going to see them uh, get into the World Series. Uh, but the fact is that they play in the National League, and the National League has a totally uh, different set of rules than the American League. Uh, the National League, you you don't have the DH that you do in the American League, and that really is a problem for me. I think both leagues should play by the same rules, but they don't, and I think what's going to happen at some point is that the DH is going to be uh, adopted by the National League as well. So, But the fact is that, uh, to me, you know, people talk about the Nats, and a lot of people will say, well, are you talking about the Washington Club uh, that existed in the Walter Johnson era? Uh, or are you talking about the uh, current team, the Walter Johnson oh, era being an American League team, the, the, the current Washington Nats, a National League team? And even when the Senators were the Senators, they were nicknamed the Nats. Am I yes, correct? they were. That. Yes. Right. And, and I, that's I, where, I David, David, you jump in there because that's where your book title came from. Right. And I, uh, well, I have a theory about that, um, coming out of a journalism background. And I think one of the reasons that the Nats has remained such a, uh, a sort of a common nickname, a bridge between the Senators and these Nationals is the fact that, uh, it's only four characters long <laughs> for, for sports page headlines. Uh, because it's also, uh, the, in the middle of Washington, and the senators, uh, the same thing, senators, N-A-T. So it, it works for both clubs, and it, it's certainly great for a, a headline writer who doesn't have to put in uh, senators or nationals in every headline. Cause JFK, LBJ. Yeah, um, yeah. We've gotten away from that. 
Yeah, we got away from that though lately. You know, you don't. You, that was all, it. Was always the Democrats who, whose initials were, were in the headlines um, until Nixon came along, and then RMN uh, sort of became popular, but not the way, um, as you say, uh, FDR um, and uh, HST and JFK. Uh, we use yeah, the but I think need, I think that we need four letter words now to describe the current president. So, <laughs> we don't, but I'm, but I mean seriously, I think that 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 word "nat" has been the bridge between the different franchises in Washington. Because I remember as I remember as a, as a, a kid uh, asking my, and this was when the senators were still here as the senators. Uh, why do people call them the Nats? Uh, and I didn't put the connection together between the middle of the word senators and Nats. And my father really had no answer. He says, well, people call them the Nats. They call them the senators. Um, and I, as, I, as I think I, I, I pointed out earlier uh, on, the, on the show, um, that it was easier um, for them to use Nats. And also, um, it's... It was, as I said, it was it was a link uh, between the two. And the final point I would make on this is that in the early years, if you look at any of the players' uniforms, all it would say is the city. Uh, it didn't have nicknames. Uh, the the closest thing you got early on was the cardinals with the bat and the, and the two cardinal birds. But for the most part, especially on the road uniforms, all it said was the name of the city. There was there were no uh, nicknames. So it was very difficult for anyone, uh, and you couldn't buy, you could not buy shirts that said, you know, Senators, National, things like that, um, the way you can now. So I think that was part of the confusion. I mean, even the Yankees, uh, all they ever had was NY and then New York on the, on the visiting uniforms. So the, the nicknames uh, were not as important as they are now, because now they're copyright too. So for the, the players and the, I mean the teams and the, and the leagues, uh, the MLB makes a lot of money selling all of these different souvenirs. Yeah, um, they sure do, David. Uh, they, yeah. You know that's all the that's all the marketing that goes on today, and it's, it's sure. a huge business. And uh, you know you want to have a product, you have to get the uh, MLB license to sell that product and and the marketing, and that's why you see all the all the caps and the jackets and the shirts and and everything that that has the uh, team uh, logo on it or whatever uh you know that's a marketing uh, effort that brings millions and millions of dollars into the coffers of the uh, of major league baseball there are teams nowadays and Arizona is one of them that have like four or five alternate uniforms right different combinations and different caps and that's all for selling in their little fans Yes. yes. Yes, it certainly it, is. And that is sickening. I mean, how can anybody identify an Arizona, uh, uh, an allegiance to uh, to a uniform like, like in the old days, the class of the three New York teams and the Washington team? That symbol, that W, is, is classy. You didn't have to do. You didn't have to have a picture of a snake on the. Uh, on the freaking cap, um, <laughs> right. and a snake looking in eleven different directions on eleven different caps that you could buy at the store. It's uh, with with color combinations that, that would make my grandmother puke. Really. Well, you know what, Ralph? When you mention that, and, and I just wanted to interject this. I'm not sure about the other teams, and Gene, maybe you know about the Yankees or, or the you know the teams in New York, but. The fact is that, uh, you know, the Philadelphia Phillies, and, and, you know, I'm in the Philadelphia area, so I see it. The Philadelphia Phillies wear a green uniform for St. Patrick's Day. I mean, to me, that is just ludicrous that you have. Well, you they've know, been wearing the, the, green caps for a long time. Major League Baseball, I remember the Mets in the 80s wearing a green cap for St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, That's I mean, okay. I think that... <laughs> The people that make the decisions are drunk. That, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at I, it I think, way, you know, I'm not sure that the Yankees, have, Gene, do you know, I mean, do the Yankees do anything special for colors or certain days, um, you know, with their uniforms that they sell in the fan shops? Well, I work, in a, I work in a local high school in Central Jersey, and kids wear different color Yankee hats, which is kind of like, 
and the Yankees are a real traditional type team, and it's really the sacrilege. Blue with the white, and uh, they can move with the green on St. Patrick's Day, and right. they have pink ones and so forth. Well, red, also, red G, uh, not only that, but if you recall, if you recall now, you you watch. Uh, All-Star game, they'll have a, a logo on the caps. They have caps during the playoffs, different uh, logos on the caps. Uh, World Series gets another cap. Um, uh, Armed Forces Day, uh, they might dress in camouflage. I mean, these are all uh, marketing ploys right. uh, that are set up and just to sell. And now they're even... You know, they're, now that well, it's for charity, but still, they are raffling off or, 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 or uniforms, uh, previously worn uniform shirts, um, to raise money for charity. The one thing I find, I don't mind this one day celebration kind of thing so much, although with the Yankees, it tugs at my heart to see them in anything but the blue and white, but the one thing that does bother me are the, the proliferation of mascots starting with the Philly Fanatic and the San Diego Chicken. I mean, baseball doesn't need these things on the field or wandering around the stands. There's enough distractions in the ballparks today uh, that keep so many people from actually watching the game that you don't need some guy in a chicken suit running around the stands. I find that a, a really a just disgraceful uh, debasement of the sport. Well, you know, David, I, I agree with you again on that, and, and that's something that in the old days of baseball, you know, you never had that kind of stuff. You you had the, the game was the entertainment, and people right. went to a ball game to be entertained, to watch the game. Today, it's become like a Broadway show. As you say, yeah. you've, got the, you've got the mascots, you've got uh, loud music, you have uh, all kinds of distractions to keep the fans so-called entertained. And and probably half of them don't even know what's happening on the field because no. they're watching all these crazy mascots doing their thing. And I know in Washington, David, I haven't been there to watch it, but I think they have some kind of a race. Uh, oh, the yeah. Mascots, the president's oh, race. George, don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fourth inning. Fourth inning, these four characters come out and then they uh and they race it's uh, it's the four the four presidents from mount rushmore but then they started to add other presidents uh for some reason i think it was uh, warren harding one one year and uh it's it's and the, but this is the only time the only time during the two and a half three hours of the, of the game that people stop and watch this thing and who's going to win that's the big, I mean, it's it's ludicrous. It's it, it's it's a, as I said, it's a debasement of the sport. Uh, people want to go to the bathroom or buy something during the half inning breaks, fine. But you know, yeah, people don't need that entertainment. And of course, it's all sponsored by either insurance companies or a hot dog company. Or so, you know, everything is is commercialized now. Absolutely, See? everything is definitely commercialized. And and I can tell you for a fact that in the in the earlier days of baseball, it was not that way. You know, players uh, were received their salary for playing, and that was basically it. Uh, you know, they didn't even think about selling their autographs or, or stuff. Right. Shops didn't even exist at that time. You know, today it's a different world. And, and, you know, the kids growing up today and the parents, I mean, you're you're spending a fortune to go to a ball game uh, because of the parking and the fees and all the kind of stuff and the, the concession prices. But But the game almost becomes secondary, in my opinion because of all the entertainment value that goes into all these crazy things that, that are happening now to get fans into the seats. I have one more nail in the coffin of we traditionalists. This year, uh, Armour All, I think it, it is, or Under, Ar uh, Under Armour. Under Armour, yeah. Under Armour. They are making all the major league uniforms this year. Their contract was moved up, and on the upper left-hand heart of the uniform will be an armor all sign, that little upside-down right. dealy that they have. It's just it's becoming like NASCAR. It's um, and it's yeah. the first time it happened with it's happening with the uniform. There'll be other ads on uniforms. 
Oh yeah, I I, I agree with you, Ralph. It's just that, opens that's up. Coming. It's coming. It's coming. Right. Yeah, I happen to I happen to agree with all of that comment, and and the fact is that the old uniforms that the players used to wear, the only identification on that uniform used to be on the inside of the label, uh, around the neck or in the uh, the uh, uh, tail Lower shirt part. tail. Who yeah, made sure it? Whether it be you know point. whether it be McGregor or Spalding or Rawlings or whoever it was, um, and now you have and Ralph, you're opening up uh, what's becoming, and I think it is going to come that you're going to have the fact that the logos are going to be highly visible. It's going to cost X amount of dollars when when a player signs a contract or when he's wearing a uniform and he gets interviewed, you're going to see that logo. So that's going to be uh, the way it is. And and NASCAR is a prime example of it. Uh, tennis is a prime example of it. Uh, skiing, uh, you, you watch the skiers when they're being interviewed uh, after winning a race or whatever it is. They're going to be standing there with the ski uh, facing outward to the camera so that gets on television. Yeah, and, that's, and golf. That's marketing. Okay. That's, yeah. And golf, you're absolutely right. You know, whether it be a Tiger Woods or Jack Nicklaus or, you know, any of those great golfers, uh, that's what the sport has become, and I'm afraid that's what's going to happen with baseball as well. Okay, now let me ask you this. Do you know the grandfather of it all? Who started it? <laughs> that's I'll a good question. You. I don't know. I'll tell you. It was Yogi Berra. Were you? Berra. Uh, I'm going to tell you how this happened. It was Yahoo, right? Yahoo. 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 Yeah. So yeah. The, the I, chocolate. The chocolate. To this day, drink, I think Yahoo came after. Was named after Yahoo uh, in some way. But Yogi Berra would uh, bought stock in Yahoo, and what they gave him was a whole bunch of, bunch of T-shirts for his teammates to wear in post-game interviews. So, and how many po- how many times in those years were uh, people clamoring to for shots of Yankees in the clubhouse and what have you? And Yogi and his teammates would wear Yuhu T-shirts, and they got a lot of publicity for it. You takes off and goes crazy over over that and Yogi owned a whole bunch of stock. They wouldn't pay him for for the ads in anything but stock. And his wife Edna insisted or his wife not Edna, that was Casey's wife. Casey's wife, yeah. Right. Um Carmen, who was Carmen. the brains behind Yogi, uh, insisted that he just get the stock where he wouldn't be taxed on it, this that and the other thing. And um, he became a multimillionaire, not on his his baseball playing, although he made a lot of money with World Series. It wasn't like the money is made today. He became um, incredibly rich because of that. And that was the first mo- time a product was sold, uh, was marketed, other than Mark McGuire marketing health products from his locker. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I made somebody laugh. I don't You made me laugh because you thought Mark McGuire. I mean, yeah, I, I don't even want to get into that discussion, but but you know, it is you got a different that with the you, you got that with his health products that at that yes. time ironically, it wasn't even illegal. Yeah. A lot of a lot of players, you know, a lot of players. They used to call them, you know, bennies or greenies or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, they used to take they were they were so called vitamin supplements. Who knows what it was? But you know that that right. would that would happen. And and Ralph, I, I really appreciate your comments about Yogi and and Gene. I guess we can uh, talk to to you about Yogi and the Yankees. You know, I I didn't even I was not even aware of that uh, marketing effort on the part of the Yankees. Uh, uh, any other Yankees that used to market, you know, a certain product? It, it a, wasn't on a part of the Yankees, Gene. Let me say it was on the part of Yogi. It was part of Yogi, right? But everybody would associate Yogi and the Yankees, right? Yeah. No well, question. With the, no question. With the Yoo-Hoo, with the Yoo-Hoo, uh, back in the mid fifties, 
my I'm a chocoholic, and uh, my favorite drink was uh, Yuhu, and my father used to get us a, a six pack of whatever we wanted, and I always opted for the Yuhu until my uncle came over who lived in town, who was a Yankee fan, and he said, "Oh wow, I can see you're drinking Yankee juice." And I said, what are you talking about? <clears throat> then he told me that Yogi was the vice president of Yuhu, and even though I didn't uh, cold turkey, I did reduce my consumption of Yuhu. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I found it a watered, very watered-down drink. I tried it a few times. I'm not a big chocolate fan, but I certainly was a big Yogi and Yankee fan, and I guess I would have tried anything that these guys pushed, but I didn't... <laughs> I didn't find that a particularly uh, good drink at all. No, I didn't either. Is it? But, you know, when we're talking about the naming thing, uh, a lot of the, the blame, if you want to call it that, uh, rests with the NFL, uh, the naming stadiums. Oh, that began. That was the big trend. Uh, you never saw Madison Square Garden being called Needick Square Garden, let's say, for example, or uh, Yankee Stadium, you Yankee Stadium. Uh, but the NFL started that trend of, of naming stadiums, uh, products getting the naming rights. In fact, there's there's been talk the last year or two about renaming Na Nationals Park here in D.C. Uh, if they could get. Uh, a company to buy the naming rights, uh, and nowadays uh, you don't. And, and, there, and there are a number of the ball, a number of baseball teams now, of course, have, uh, franchises have also adopted that uh, kind of program. And you know, the older guys, uh, you know, uh, commit, uh, uh, Yankee Stadium, uh, uh, Fenway, uh, the, the older they've stayed away from this thing. But the newer teams, or the teams that really need the money. Have adopted this uh, this pro target field in Minneapolis. Well, the company is right there in Minneapolis, but uh, you, it becomes difficult to know what franchise you're talking about because every few years, uh, the, 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 the different team, a different company comes along and buys the, the naming rights. Right now, it's City Field in New York. But what is it going to be in ten years? You know. Yeah, you know, David, you, you touch upon a good subject there. And, and Chad, you being out there in, in Minnesota, I know it's, you know Target Field, but I know people will say to me, "Well, what do you think about the new stadium?" And to be honest with you, you know, I have to think because I really don't know. I refer to a stadium like in like in Detroit. I refer to it as either Briggs Stadium or Tiger Stadium. You know, I think it's what Comerica Park or something now. And and in Philadelphia, I always knew it as Connie Mack Stadium uh, or Shy Park. Uh, or, you know, or, today or the vet. vet yes, or, or yeah, the vet. Uh, but you know, it's, it's now CB Park. And, and and the Eagles in football, as you're talking about, you know, David, there's a, there's a prime example. You know, their stadium, a separate stadium from the Philly Stadium. Is Lincoln Financial Field? So yeah. you know, it, it's well, how become, about Wrigley Field? That was yeah. The, well, it, it wasn't the only Wrigley. There was a Wrigley Field in L.A. where they right. filmed Home Run Derby. But right, um, and also the Pride of the Yankees was filmed at Wrigley Field in L.A. Oh, yeah. Supposedly, that. supposedly that film, and I have some issues with that film, not with Lou Gehrig, obviously, but with the film itself. You know, that Wrigley Field supposedly was to represent Yankee Stadium where Lou Gehrig gave his luckiest man speech, which to me, again, is ludicrous because L.A.'s Wrigley Field has no resemblance at all to Yankee Stadium, the you know, the house that Ruth built. Well, that's, that's, I'm sure that was a financial consideration. Oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah. Metro Gold Mayor was in Los Angeles. So yeah, I mean, why go to New York when you've got a perfectly yeah. empty stadium? Over there? I know, but uh, but I'm an old I'm an old purist traditionalist. That when I say it, it bothers me because I know, oh, it, you know I, I know it's not true. You know, I was at Yankee Stadium one time. One time. We had a big crowd, and they were filming a movie starring Bob Hope. I think it was called Bo Jest. And everybody was told um, they're going to be filming this scene where Bob Hope, and I think it was, I don't even know if it was Bob Hope or standing, would come out of the dugout and walk out toward, toward the pitcher's mound. And everyone was told to applaud when the one that did this. And I remember they, did, they filmed the scene right before the start of, uh, of one of the Yankee games, uh, right there in, in Yankee Stadium. No, no phony. <laughs> 
I think it was about uh, what's his name? you know the old mayor in New York. Uh, I forget his name. Guardia. No, no, not LaGuardia. One of the sort of cheesy um, uh, mayors uh, <laughs> who had with Tammany Hall. He was a big Tammany Hall guy. Anyway, um, but there they did it, you know, in Yankee Stadium. So. Huh. Very interesting. My mother attended the uh, the Lou Gehrig speech in 1939. Oh, really? In wow. Yankee Stadium. She was a 19-year-old... Uh, young woman and, and you know Ralph I think I've mentioned to you you know you, you talk about your mom being there my dad was on the field I mean I have a photograph in my office my dad's standing right, be, right behind Lou Gehrig when Lou gave us oh speech. wow and uh, you know to me that's why when I see pride of the Yankees I mean it was a wonderful film talking about a wonderful life you know legendary Lou Gehrig but when I see Gary Cooper you know, in L- in L.A.'s Wrigley Field, given the luckiest man speech, it just personally bothers me because I know the real story. Yeah, well, he couldn't. Have, he he never played baseball. I mean, no, he was played. he was right-handed portraying yeah. the left-handed Lou Gehrig. Well, they rever- What they did was they shot it in reverse, from what I was right. told. Yes, they did. Uh, they, they had him running. Was, they had him hitting the ball. Right. They had him hitting the ball and running the third the base. Third. They reversed the film, so now <laughs> right. he's running the first base. Yeah, yeah. And they the transposed magic. the number on his back. That's right. Yeah, the right. four because it was made flop backwards. The right. magic Three. of Hollywood. Oh yes, it <laughs> was a four. You're right. That's four. Right. Yeah, Ruth. Babe Ruth um, was three. And you know what? That that's another subject. We're talking about marketing. Uh, <laughs> I see, you know, kids wearing, you know, shirts or fans wearing shirts, and on the back it'll have number three, Ruth. Well, yeah. you know, <laughs> right. when, when, ba- when Babe yeah. Ruth played for the Yankees in the in the late 20s, I don't think they changed the till like, the numbers, numbers became, and that was the batting order around 1929. But when Babe Ruth first played and Lou Gehrig first played for the Yankees, and Gene will attest to this, you know, there were no numbers on the uniforms at all. Right, right. Right, absolutely. Boy, you know, and the Yankees are still one of the only teams that do not put the names on the back. I think the Red Sox held out until about a year or so ago, and now they put the names on the on the visiting uniforms, which makes a little more sense. The, the, the uh, uh, crowds outside of Fenway may not be as familiar with the players as they are at Fenway, so they put the names on the back of the Red Sox or, uh, visiting uniforms. And there was some sort of an event this year in Major League Baseball where all teams wore these ridiculous cartoonish uniforms, including the Yankees, and they did indeed have the names of the players on the back of the uniform. Well, don't forget, one each year they or everybody wears number forty-two in honor of Jackie Robinson. They everybody wears forty-two. Absolutely well deserved. Oh yeah, I, mean, I can I can see that. But but Gene, I think what Ralph is talking about didn't they have something about nicknames or something on the on the? Oh YouTube? yeah, you're Some right. Some sort of cartoonish nickname thing, but it ended up where, uh, for one reason or another, the names of the players were identified, or maybe their nicknames. It was nicknames. It was nicknames. Yeah, that nickname. Right. But that was. Um, Chad, you're uh, you're younger. What do you think of all of this? Um, well, I think they're marketing to not just men and boys anymore. They market to women. They market to people who are just in the fashion. I mean, I know how many women who wear pink uh, Yankee hats. I mean, it's a marketing thing. And if, you, if the game is to grow, they got to market them. And that's the problem, and that's the only way to do it. And as far as putting uh, a couple of these names on things, it's just the wave of the future. Basketball is doing it now. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but that's just the way the world is moving. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something. If you want to keep the game alive, why don't you start televising some of these World Series games during the day when the kids can see them? Amen. Make it make it the same for an all-star team. That 
is cheap. You don't have to change anything, and you don't have to um, screw up tradition to do it. And yeah, but they've already but they sold off the network, and that's the networks are the ones who, who are the are the ones who decide that. And that's they've right. Already sold out because of the money, and they need the money, so they're willing to sacrifice certain things. And I agree with you. I think a three fifteen World Series game would be wonderful, but they won't do it. No, yeah, even if they did, even even if they did, first psychiatrist. I mean, you're making a little bit more money now, but how? By not building a fan base of kids, thirty years from now, these kids aren't going to have memories like we do to look back upon. And I, I can't see sure. what's happening in the game. Um, you know, if they made, the, if they gave away "quote unquote" the home run derby. And broadcast it on Sunday afternoon, because and then the players would have because I think that's what that's what hurt um, Aaron Judge uh, he, that home run derby. Um, he's not. I'm sure he won't he won't participate this year. But if they had the home run derby on the Sunday before the Tuesday All Star game, the players not only would have a, a, a day of rest, but also uh, it's a day game. Kids could see it. Uh, a day game during the week is not going to bring in anybody because the, the, the people are working or going, you know, the kids might be in uh, summer school or at camp or whatever. Yeah, but you, you also have, you got to remember one thing about the All-Star game. It's in the middle of the summer. Kids are out playing or doing things during the afternoon. You know, I don't think you're going to see ratings go any better for kids to watch it then. I, I think no. It's yeah. better to have it at like five or six o'clock at night. Well, yeah, even that would be a better would be a, than eight thirty, quarter to nine. Yeah, you're right. I, I, and how about giving away tickets to boys and girls clubs, to orphanages, to everybody? Every kid in a city should get in absolutely free, not to the game, but to the home run derby, for instance. If you if they're making such a big thing out, out of the home run derby. Bring the kids in free. They can't stay up to see the game anyway. So do something along those lines and take the bite. One event a year is going yeah. to kill the networks. Uh, also, I mean, it would it would and it's it, an pro- investment in the future. Excuse and me. And not only I'm sorry, you know, not only investment in the future, which is true, but it also would drum up interest in the game coming up, the All Star Game itself. Yeah, I, I think I think the All Star Game, in my opinion, and I've mentioned this before. I think it's lost a lot of its appeal, you know, with interleague play and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, used to be the All Star Game. I was, agree. It was called the Midsummer Classic, and it was a game that was played. Which league is better, American League or National League? You know, today it's really an exhibition. Some players they don't even want to play. I mean, uh, it used to be a well, tremendous it's, honor it's, it's, to be selected to the All Star team. What's that, Chad? They only play a couple of innings. They used to play, I mean, those guys used to be upset when they got pulled from the game. Now, oh, let me play two, three years, let me go do an interview so I can be on TV. Right. Well, I think part of that is trying to get everybody in that's been selected as an all-star player. Well, they do. They do, David. And, and yet, yeah. And Gene, I think if you'll recall, I know that my dad was selected and played the entire game, the all-star game in 1943. Joe McCarthy was the manager. I think five or six Yankees were selected to that game. And, and, you know, McCarthy and the Yankees were criticized because of the fact that, you know, they were the pennant winners and all that. And I think McCarthy made a point. He did not play one Yankee at all the entire game. That's right. That's right. Yep. (laughs) And and the American League won anyway. Yeah, they did win. They hated each other then. And that was the first night game that was played. It was played at Chai Park here in Philly. That's right. Yeah, yeah. God, you, you guys I rem- learn you- something from you guys every week. Well, I, rem- I remember running home from – we used to have a, a playground league. Uh, and running home uh, to see – there were two All-Star games for a couple of years, if you recall. Right. Um, so the, the same guys, for the most part – 
uh, would participate in in both. Now, I don't know when they start. I mean, I know a lot of the guys, their contracts, you know, had these little clauses in. If you make the All-Star team, it's worth so much money. If you That, that wasn't part of the the old days, I don't believe. I think, you know, if you were selected the All-Star, you, you took it as a matter of pride, and you went as long as you were happy. Yeah, I, I think you're right, David. As far as I remember, I never recall – my dad ever saying to me about anything about an incentive in his contract about making the all-star team. But I do know that it was a, a badge of honor. I know for a fact that the players really, you know, look forward to it. If they were selected, it was, it was fantastic. You know, they really enjoyed it. If they played in the game, if they started or whatever, I mean, it was a great honor. Uh, you know, to me, George, that was what, what the game was about. what did you think the morning that Templeton – Greg Templeton, who's traded for Ozzie Smith. He had a big Gary time. Templeton, huh? Uh, uh, Gary Templeton, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, he comes out and says, if I ain't starting, I ain't departing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. When you read that in the headlines uh, um, in the sports page, what did you, you think? Yeah, of well, it, you know, those kind of things bother me, Ralph. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a traditionalist. I admit it. I mean, I like it the way the game used to be, not what the game has become. Uh, and, okay, and, now you, you know, said and I also I also see photographs. That... I want to make mention of this because this bothers me, and we never really got into our discussion of, about the uh, transition of baseball in Washington, but. The fact is, if you look around today, and I have a picture from, I think it was last year's All-Star game, the American League is celebrating. The, some players have it down, the, the pants down that are shoe tops. One player had his, had his shirt hanging out his pants. I mean, to me, this is showing lack of respect for not only the game, but it, when you're wearing a baseball uniform. And, in, and I also have seen pictures of the 30s and 40s all-star teams when the players are all dressed identically, they're in their uniforms, and it was a, a point of pride. Today it almost seems like, you know, players don't really care. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, yeah, well, i got to be there, but, but so what? I mean, to me, that that's wrong. Well, um, by nature of the word uniform, they call it a uniform. <laughs> Un- yeah. right. I think everybody sh- should wear the same uniform. <laughs> and one in the story. same way, yeah. Well, in the same way, yeah. The, the old days, uh, when, you know, for starting with, say, Walter Johnson, that era, maybe even before that. But And I know when I played, I mean, my dad, the first thing he taught me when I was 11-year-old playing Little League, how to wear a baseball uniform. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what you did. And, and when you see most of the photographs of, of players – uh, during those years, the, the baseball pant is worn to mid-calf, and they have stirrups, and, and they right. wear it in, in pride. You know, today, they, they wear these pajama bottoms, you know, shirt tails hanging out, all kinds of jewelry adorning their necks. I mean, when when my dad played, no player would dare walk on the field with, with a necklace around his neck. I mean, they just didn't do it. And and that's the way the players dressed and the uniform, as you say, Ralph, it was a uniform. You wore it with pride and you wore it uniformly. By the same token, I don't think management should come down on players because of their individuality on how they want to wear their hair, this, that, and the other thing. Because if you look through the history of baseball, We've had mustaches way back in the 20s, this, that, and the other thing. Um, to say, yeah, every player has to be clean-shaven, that's another thing. Um, uh, I'm just... Uh, no, I know some, some teams, Ralph, some teams, have, some teams have had that rule, and, and that doesn't bother me as much. I mean, I, I agree. If, if you're individual, you want to wear your hair longer or you want to have a beard or, or whatever it is, that's, that's one thing. But but to me, when you got some guys wearing a uniform hiked up to their their knees uh, with no stirrups uh, or pajama bottoms all the way down to their shoe tops, shirt tails hanging out, I mean to me that's that's wrong. That that doesn't respect the game. Right. Well, well, what's ironic? The the stirrups used to be a very part, big part of the fashion. Color. Uh, design, I remember the Cardinals stirrup, um, 
Gene, you're a Cardinal fan. Am I right about that? Absolutely. And then the, the, the size of the stirrup itself changed. I think with the uh, Oakland A's, um, it used to be sort of a white behind the uh, color of the, of the hose. Yeah, it was, it was well, a white sanitary hose. Yeah, the sanitary, right. But uh, then that, that, that uh, area became bigger and bigger so that this, the, um, the stirrup itself was pulled up more toward the knee, if you know what I mean. Right. Uh, so there, there was more of the sanitary hose showing uh, than previously. Um, and, and Charlie Finley did change things with uniform colors. That I'm yeah, sure. he did. Charlie Finley went to white shoes and gold sanitary. Right, right. Yeah. yeah um, and you know what? You're talking about sanitaries. I can remember when I was playing, and Gene, maybe with the Cardinals or the Yankees, they didn't do it. But I know when I was a kid, we used to like to have our sanitaries being high. So we would have our mothers actually cut the bottom of the sanitary, put elastic uh, between the two the two pieces of the hose, and then you'd wear it and you'd hike it up as high, as far as you could get. It looked like you know the higher the sanitary, the stronger you were. <laughs> so, well, the oh, faster, interesting. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Do you suppose that's why your dad was so fast because of his sanies? <laughs> I don't know, but I I can tell you this. I I know you know, and I'm look. I'm I'm 11 years old playing little league baseball. I get my first uniform. I'm excited. I fall asleep wearing it. My dad is laughing about it. But underneath my baseball socks, I had my first pair of sanitary hose, and I was so excited. Oh, wow. Good. Hey, maybe you could tell me you've been in the sporting good business all these years. Where can one get old-fashioned sleeves, what they call sleeves? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. Really, that's a good anymore? Yeah, that's a good question, Ralph. I don't know whether the like Mitchell and Ness uh, or Ebbets Field Finals, they do a lot of the retro stuff. It, it could be that you could get them, you know, from them. I don't know. I don't know who markets no, that today. No, I, I have checked it out. I've checked everything I, be, yeah. I could. I um, can't find Slee Olfad. They were woolen and they were heavy and um, can't find them anymore. Well, you can't find a lot of things. You can't find good locks. You can't find good knishes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Are they some kind of baseball? <laughs> uh, if you, if, if, if you find a good knish, let me know. Uh, I will definitely, <laughs> Chad. Um, if you find a good knish in Minnesota, you got a scoop. You let everybody know. I know. You're in a shimmo. You're in a shimmo. you a good challenge, too. That's who used to make great knishes, Yoni Schimmel, down in the Lower uh, East Side. I don't remember that. I re remember Ratners on the Lower East Side. Yeah, and, um, and um, uh, Katz's. Yes. Katz's is still there. That's when uh, um, Two Cents Plane is Ten Cents Now. I don't know if you remember <laughs> that little, little jingle. All right, guys. Um Anything you guys want to close with, Gene? We haven't heard much from you. Anything you uh, you want to add to all of this? No, but I used to love them uh, conditions I used to get in Greenpoint. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. And me in Coney Island, as a matter of, matter of fact, my my grandmother loved Coney Island. She'd say. It's just one stop from the funeral. She, she, <laughs> the burial. It's just one stop on the subway. Uh, you'll come and visit me. You can have Nathan's. She called it Nathan's. And you'll come. Uh, an, an open invitation to Schmilowitz Burial Society. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're out there, and uh, we'll draw your map. Uh, I'll publish a map. You can go visit my mishpacha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's not going to be much interest for that, huh? Right. Just a thought. Um, Gene, uh, thank you for being here. Chad Rubin, David Hubler. Thank and, you. And uh, we got two genes in one booth that's uh, doing something. 
Oh, now we got a George. I'm sorry. I'm getting that's, old. That's, that's all right. That's what, that, it's a G. <laughs> G-O. Hey, can I ask, right, can I ask Gene, can I ask Gene one quick thing before we go? Gene, the other day there was a discussion about Stan Musial and, uh, and the name Stan the Man. And I was told or read that it was coined by, uh, Bob Bragg, who was the St. Louis sports writer for the Post Dispatch, when he went to see a, a ball game at, uh, you know, either Ebbets Field or the Polo Ground, Stan Musial was playing and the fans were saying, well, here's, there's that man again, and he came up with the nickname Stan the Man. Now, have you heard that story before? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was in Ebbets Field. Uh, prior to that, Ebbets he was Field, known, okay. He was the Benora Greyhound. Okay. Oh. Wow. But, but the name, the name Stan the Man, was coined. Uh, okay, yeah. very good. Thank you. I, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I wasn't sure that that was true, but that was told to me the other day. Yeah, here comes that man again. Right. Uh, no one ever had a bad thing to say about Stan Musial. No. I, no. A you know, class great guy guys, all the way. Great, great player. Way. You know, great person. Just wonderful guy. Well, Frank Sullivan didn't like him in the 1955 All Star Game. <laughs> well, I explained that. I don't remember that. Uh, Stan Musial with a 12th inning home run in the 55 All Star Game off of. Uh, Frank Sullivan from the Red Sox Ooh. to win the game. Okay. Now, my first Red Sox game. played the Cardinals in the first year of my birth, 1946. So, uh, uh, Mad Dash for home. Johnny Pesky, huh? Co- if, had Culberson been playing center field, had, had um, Dom DiMaggio been playing center field, things would have been different. There was a guy named Colbertson playing center for the Red Sox that day, if I remember correctly. DiMaggio hurt his uh, ankle or foot sliding into second base, tying the game up. Right. But yeah, and DiMaggio had, DiMaggio had a good arm, probably would have thrown, but I think uh, Colbertson had to throw to Pesky, and Pesky delayed on returning the throw, and that allowed Slaughter to, to score. Uh, I think that's the story. Yeah, right. He was the old guy's Charlie Hustle was in a slaughter. He sure was. And someday we'll talk about did he or did he not spike Jackie Robinson. <laughs> I'll, I'm going to ask that to, to Gene on the Cardinal show that he does on this network. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, so listen for that. And um, everybody out there, I thank you guys for being here and you guys out there for listening. If you enjoy any of our offerings on the network or this one in particular, please box up some lightly used children's books and take them down to your Head Start program in whatever community you live in. Um, That may not be good English, but what it is... Does he Dean say about that? Take the books, let the kids grow up smarter than the host, and um, let them learn, let them get interested, and let them get school ready. If there are going to be changes in this here country, it's got to come from educating children and empowering them to think for themselves. And no better way than through reading. Do that for me if you would. Please come back next week and listen to us. Um, I'm very grateful for the guys that uh, participate. Thank you, gentlemen. See you next week. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye now. Ralph you, Ralph, you want me to call in again on the hour? Absolutely. Okay. I'll give you five minutes. All right. Okay. Five Bye. minutes it is. We'll see you okay. guys then. Um, be well, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>